<laughs> I'd like to thank you for this uh, presentation of uh, such an innovative approach to uh, uh, digital scholarly editing, for actually you have uh, also created a uh, digital scholarly editing more in the traditional sense, embedded in this more virtual um, edition. Uh, and I guess this uh, innovative quality is also why perhaps you get those questions you, <laughs> you were um, speaking about uh, in the beginning of your presentation. So, um, feel free to pose any questions, any immediate, immediate questions, or I have uh, some also. <laughs> perhaps here. Yeah, well, I have questions about the user. I, I do programming and uh, the internet things like that, and uh, it seems like uh, there is a big, fantastic vision about the users producing uh, new editions, which would be interesting. But it seems that that like the audience. Uh, is maybe not so so big. So uh, how have you thought about that? Yes, we in, indeed we have. Actually, we did uh, last year in September a year ago. We did uh, user testing. So we had a group of users uh, with different knowledge about the Book of Disquiet and about the SOA. So this included uh, two secondary school students, uh, a university student. Uh, secondary school teachers, uh, university teachers, uh, scholars of the SOA, so say from the novice to the expert, and we gave them a basic introduction to the archive, and this will be part of the all the meta information that will help users, and we uh, try to understand what difficulties they had. Uh, what they could do. One of the things we realized is that the virtual function is very difficult. It's very complex. And so we are, uh, actually we, we, did, we, we also did um, videotaping of the users. So while the users were uh, moving about the archive and experimenting, uh, we, were, we, we did a, a kind of user testing that was based on surveys, but also based on actually filming the user and asking the user to comment while he or she was moving around the menus and manipulating the text and comparing the text, what uh, they were thinking and what the difficulties were. And we realized that it's a very difficult uh, object. And so we are working. Uh, this interface does not, reflect the th does not reflect the stage of the interface now. The interface is much more simpler. Uh, and we are uh, devising uh, aids, different kinds of aids that will automatically uh, help the user without giving too many information, uh, too much information. And the issue of the user is a very important issue. And one of the things that we want to do uh, when we put the archive online with the final interface in, well, sometime, uh, we want to run another series of uh, tests by creating two communities and working with those two communities, one community of university students, one community of 12th grade students during one semester and see how they use the archive and see how we can make the archive more user-friendly. No, the but you're right. No, it's one thing is to imagine this mythic user, and the other is to see how people actually behave when they're faced with this archive. I think the archive has a lot of potential because the the well, first of all, because the text is amazing. No, it's just the the beauty of the text, the complexity of the text. Uh, no, the the almost I was saying to someone that. In the Book of Disquiet, almost every sentence can be quoted. No? And so there's not many works of uh, which you can say that. And so the writing is wonderful. No? It's, uh, it, 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 it catches your imagination, your thoughts. And so I think that's one of the reasons why the archive will be, uh, I think, uh, read and, and used. But the, the virtual editing, the virtual writing, these are very complex functions, not just 
in terms of manipulating the interface face and understanding, but even conceptually, you know, because the idea that you can change the text, that you can rewrite the text, is something that people are not comfortable with. And so the idea that you can think of interacting with texts in a different way from what we are used to, that is challenging. Um, I guess that the problem of uh, the user is also uh, partly inherited from the, the scholarly editing, because that's a, a common problem for the scholarly editions in general, even those in book format, that who is reading them anyway, <laughs> apart so from us. Who are reading them anyway, apart from a very limited uh, um, group of uh, interested researchers. Yeah. So, uh, but, and I guess the, the, the combination is uh, disquieting <laughs> of the expert, uh, uh, the expert element of the textual edition, uh, uh, scholarly edition, and um, the, the role collab playing. Yeah, because that's two words that yeah. don't meet so of, uh, often, right? Yes. So, but I had a question relating actually to, to uh, the one Swiss Sparky post, and, uh, and that is about. Uh, the role of the author. You were speaking now of the text and its uh, um, beauty and uh, literary quality. And, and the question is actually one I hate to, to uh, be asked myself. <laughs> and that is, if it's really justifiable to invest so much scholarly effort and um, technical development in one literary work, or one author usually. Uh, because it seems to me that some digital uh, editions, they try to build a model that could be usable for other editions as well, uh, uh, editions of other texts by other authors. But in this case, it seems to me that, like it's um, connected, your way of uh, conceptualizing this uh, is uh, connected to, to this spe spe specific work with all the fragments and all the problematic editorial history of it. Um, I wonder if you could comment that. Yeah, that, that is a question that I've uh, been asked before. Uh, I do think that there is a potential in this model for similar works. There are a number of modernist works that have this fragmentary character, that have several editions, and so parts of this model, or even the model itself, could be tried on other works. Uh, but you are right in the sense that the whole idea was, uh, well, I, I would say that the source for the idea has to do with all the reading and all the experience that I gained uh, in during the last 15 years just by looking at what editors are doing when they are migrating texts to digital formats. And so there are many good ideas, many uh, interesting concepts, uh, like even the concept of radiant textuality, or that concept that I expressed in the initial quote of creating a system that allows you to reconstruct or construct the possibilities, rather than just representing what's happened to a text in the past. And I think that was the drive behind the conceptualization of the project and by and, and that led us to this particular technical implementation and that is well when I when I conceived of the project and I thought of uh, which text could be uh, experimented on this was the text that occurred to me you know? uh, but I I wonder you now if this is a model for the book of Disquiet, or if it's it's a model for fragmentary works that we could address. You know? But I'm also making a different claim, you know, and the claim is the claim that we can relate to texts in ways that are different from the representational model that has tended to dominate our relation with the text. So. What we try to do when we do editing is to do a exo an exhaustive 
an accurate representation of all the material features of the text in order to guarantee some objective uh, reference. And I think that one of the dimensions that the digital representation uh, adds to that is the dimension of sim simulation, flexibility, rest restructuring. And again, when we think of literary experience, I do not see why we cannot think of writing or rewriting as an element in the process of relating to texts. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, uh, I don't know who was first now. I'm not sure. Was it you? Uh, I, I have a question. Thank you for this. This was a very interesting project. As I understand, uh, you have editions and users will create new editions based on previous edition and then all the users can create, can build on that. Yes. You keep track of that. So, uh, like, can you see in the end when you have a lot of edition, will you be able to see the tree of how it was created? Yes, so you can see, for instance, in this, in this example that I was showing earlier, if you go here to class Y, and you see that this virtual edition was created on the basis of this edition, no? Mm -hmm. So if now I'm looking at this edition and I create, I add this fragment to my edition, you will have a different genealogy here. It will be class Y, BNP, mm -hmm. BNP, no? And that, that process is uh, uh, recursive. So you will have the genealogy of a specific fragment and you will know that the first user selected the fragment from this edition and then Actually, uh, the, the, there, there are only five versions of each fragment. So one is our topographic transcription, and the other is the other four critical editions. So ultimately, any fragment has one of these five sources, independently of having some virtual edition in between as, as the immediate source. Uh, uh -huh. uh, it was not so much a question, but I, I had a comment on your comment to, to Jenny's question because what jumps into my mind when I say this is, is, is Julio Cortázar's Rayuela, uh, which he actually tried to do in a printed novel uh, working like this. So, I mean, it could be even if you're not working with fragment, uh, fragment text, it could, I mean, even novels could be. Um, yeah, you, you could think of it as a, a generative a mechanism for writing, yeah, no, yeah. rather than just editing, mm -hmm. no, yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, when I was talking about earlier about the idea of bringing together different approaches and different tools and different perspectives, uh, I think the point is also to rethink textuality beyond the model of the book, because we've so far we've think we've thought about textuality based on the model of the printed book mm -hmm. and we've imported that model to the digital space to the digital medium and very often representations and ways of organizing uh, texts ways of thinking about texts are modeled on the structures of the book and the electronic medium has potential for approaches and thoughts in terms of textuality that do away with the book. And so when we have a, a project like the Book of Disquiet, which is a book project, and you have a history of editions of that book project, you can use it as a test for exploring the digital medium itself. So what can I do with this material, which is not just an emulation of the, fac of the facsimile, which is not just an accurate representation of the critical editions, but which uses the affordances of 
the medium itself, namely the participation, the possibility of participation, not just the possibility of processing and comparing and text mining, etc., but the participation to make readers engage with the text in different positions. Think of the text not as an object, but as something that is co-constructed in the process of reading, editing, writing, rewriting. Okay. <coughs> Will this be available to everyone on the internet? Yes. Have you had any problems with copyrights or stuff? Because, I mean, Pissau himself is, is dead enough, as we say, but, but all those editors, how do you get there? Yeah, I, I always have that question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a very important question, no? because Pessoa, uh, the work of Fernando Pessoa went into the public domain in 2005, uh, so 70 years after his death. But, of course, the editors have copyright on their specific uh, organizations of the text, on the apparatus, etc. I was fortunate enough to guarantee the collaboration of the editors. So the three living editors are uh, collaborating with the project and they have made uh, an agreement uh, that the, those editions will be uh, usable within the archive in the terms of the archive. No? Users will not be allowed to use the editions in different contexts or produce books out of those, but they will be allowed to work with those editions within the environment of the archive. So uh, that, that is the copyright agreement uh, that we that we have. Yes, every everyone in the world. So the the initial the, the 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 ultimate goal of the project is to make this the source for anyone studying the book of Disquiet, because we we want to add uh, in the next stage we want to add studies essays. Uh, reception documents, also some translations, so that the archive is uh, uh, used by people around the world. And I was very pleased to hear that you're thinking about including also translations, yeah. because that's one way of solving the, the question of a, a limited target group when you're um, when you don't uh, work with a, an, um, an author writing in English, yeah. <laughs> for example, uh, that you can you can uh, create a more international context by using the translations. Um, I was actually I'm not sure I understood uh, about the metatextual um, annotations. Uh, I understand that you can make those in the virtual um, edition, but in your own when you have transcribed the text, you have um, also some markup mm -hmm. uh, and also some thematic markup. Or did mm -hmm. I misunderstand? Mm -hmm. the, the thematic markup will be added on top of the TI. So it's not in the TI actually, it will be added uh, through the tag. But if you say the metatextual information has, uh, so if you go to the advanced search functionalities, uh, some of that information is already in the TI header of each file and that information relates to whether the source is uh, typewritten or handwritten, whether it's been published or not, whether the, da the date, right? whether it's dated or not, the, the conjectural date, uh, uh, the acronym, so uh, the, the, the book Pessoa, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this, but Pessoa had many acronyms, so he wrote under different names. But these names are not pseudonyms, they are what he called other authors. Now, actually, the word acronym was redefined by Pessoa himself. Uh, so the acronym is another author. So he's an author who writes in a different style, and the expression of the author is that form of writing. So it's a different subjectivity, it's a different self. And he has created many of these selves. Uh, well, there are five major acronyms, but the more uh, uh, enthusiastic Pessoa scholars have found between 100 and 200 acronyms. No? So, uh, 
I'm not going to argue <laughs> with them, but in the case of the Book of Disquiet, there are two heteronyms. Initially, well, actually there are three, so some people claim there are three, but most agree that there are two. He started the book with one heteronym, and this was for the first phase of writing in the uh, late 19, from 1913 to 1918. And so in the second stage of writing, in the late 1920s and early 1930s, he came up with another heteronym, and the styles changed uh, significantly. So one of the metatextual elements, now besides date, uh, type of uh, material, type of uh, text, will be heteronym. Now some editions have attributed the first part to Vicente Gedge, which was the original heteronym, the second part to Bernardo Soares, the second heteronym. Some editions have attributed everything retrospectively only to the later heteronym. So the book is attributed to Bernardo Soares. And the latest edition by Pizarro uh, ignores the heteronym attribution and attributes the book to Fernando Pessoa. So these are different, these are different types of metatextual information that is encoded in the TI header and that can result in uh, lists of texts uh, in this advanced search functionality and they can become the source for a new edition. In terms of the semantic markers, those would be tags that users add mm -hmm. and those semantic tags then will be searchable as well and then you could uh, generate, say, some of the big themes of the Book of Disquiet, you know, like uh, uh, self, consciousness. Uh, we could think also of uh, that idea of observing life li rather than living life. So some, of some are major topics. So you could, as an individual user, classify specific fragments with those semantic markers and then you could generate an ordering of fragments based on your semantic tagging of those fragments. So the addition would be based on either metatextual information at the level of the TI header or metatextual information that's generated in the process of interacting with the fragment. Okay, I think we have time for just one last question, if there is any. Well, I have a question. Uh, it's, uh, I, I understand that this uh, project, the purpose is not to give access to a text. I am not a literary scholar, I come from other parts of the humanities. And I uh, uh, found this uh, interesting and a bit fascinating with the digital humanities and, and literature, that uh, the texts are not sort of there to be read and interpreted and uh, like used uh, as texts in, in history or ideas, for instance. And uh, then I, I just uh, wonder about, uh, like, for ordinary persons, like I am an ordinary person in this context, I would be interested in reading this book, but then I would need the help uh, of an editor. And I, uh, I want to know the best edition to start with. And uh, can I download it as, as a PDF file? Or what, like, what kind of engagement is would you say is like appropriate for me and how do you relate to that kind of uh, user? Well, that's, that's a very good question because many people uh, uh, think on those terms and many users will be interested in reading, not so much in manipulating or... Uh, the first yeah, it's the as the first step. So we are trying to make the edition uh, also a reading edition. No. And so the, if you go through, there will be a, 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 an interface that has a, a table of contents and you can go through the fragments and the, actually the, the, the responsiveness of the uh, programming and of the interfaces will allow them to be uh, readable in different devices and so we are thinking about mobile or tablets or other f forms of uh, uh, presentation, screen presentation, and uh, 
we are not going to say which edition people should read, no? Uh, because th th that's a point that we've, well, at least myself, no? Uh, we've, we've just put it aside, no? I'm not sure. Because when, and actually just by revising and going through the encoding of the files and the different editions, uh, I find very good reasons for any of the decisions they've made, no? So these editors have made good decisions, but they are very different. There are four different ways of organizing the, the text. Uh, of course, the first edition is the least accurate in terms of transcription, because many things have not been deciphered uh, in the 1980s, and then later editors uh, improved. No? There are readings. Very, some passages are, one wonders how they could read those passages, no? because it's just like, it's even worse than cursive or uh, stenography, no? just like a continuous line. So what word is in there? But they manage to read it. And once they read and they offer a good reading, you know that's the word. No? They, 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 they are right. And once an edition is right, the other editors incorporate that correction, often silently. And this is one interesting thing. If you look at the genealogy of the editions, so there are now, if you add all of these editions, there are maybe 15 or 16 different editions. But if you compare them, in terms of the reading of passages, as time goes by, they become more like each other because they are incorporating good readings that they find in the other editors. So this is another interesting thing that was not in your question, but the relation between the editors is a relation of competition. No. They are not collaborators. No. They are unacknowledged collaborators, silent collaborators, insofar as they read what the others have done and then if they find a good solution they also adopt it, but rarely they acknowledge it. And they are also uh, competitors in the market because each edition is published by a different publisher. And so whenever a new edition comes out by editor A, editor B also puts out a new edition and editor C. And so you can see the dynamics of editing, not just as, as a scholarly dy dynamics, but as a social dynamics of market competition and authority competition over the text. You know? Who owns the text? Who is the editor of the text? Who defines what the text is? So I'm not making that call. So I'm not going to say, you should read this one. You should start by this one. Uh, but I think the archive will have uh, that level also, no, just the, a basic reading level where you can go through the text without uh, getting uh, lost in, 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 in this labyrinth. No? And, th and that is the challenge from the point of view of computer communication and interface design is how do you create such a complex archive and make it understandable for a common user or someone who comes to the Book of Disquiet for the first time and just wants to read and know what it is. You know? that, that, but that is a challenge. You know, to, and I think that is also something where we may fail. You know, is, uh, we may fail in communicating what we are doing. Because this is very difficult. And I know by working with other archives that archives uh, tend to become very complex. And after a while, only scholars or experts use them. They drive readers away. 